right? I know we're right after lunch, so we'll try and keep this session lively. So uh, <laughs> what I'm also going to kind of do is, outside of the questions that I have for Achyut, mm -hmm. we'll also open it up to audience questions. Uh, you know, maybe I'll spend the first 10 minutes chatting up with Achyut, and we'll also try and get some audience questions in. Uh, so Achyut, I know we did give a quick intro about what what Fix does, right. but you know, uh, why don't you give us the rundown of uh, what does uh, what Fix do? And then you know, I know you're a lot uh, in the news these days. I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> want to hear about that as well. So give us a brief overview of uh, sure. What um, I'll start with the problem statement. So typically your large enterprises, they invest a lot of money into their products like your enterprise application services like a CRM or an HCM. Um, and they definitely want to see user productivity from that. Um, and our data tells us that uh, in the first year, there's only about 30 to 40% adoption of this particular product. And that's a cause of concerns for a lot of CIOs or ISVs for that matter who are implementing this because that's churn for them. Um, the traditional methods of how you get a user onboarded to a new product that you introduce is classroom trainings or a verbose documentation somewhere. And mm -hmm. that typically doesn't work in today's world because it's more of an on-demand world. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of customer support tickets that are raised saying that I don't know how to do certain things or I can't find the information that I need to uh, to achieve whatever I'm supposed to. So the the goal is, can you give the user of such products guidance within the application itself um, that prevents his need to leave the application number one or and give him contextual information when he needs it, where he needs it within the application. So that's the guiding principle and that's what Watfix does. It's an interactive guidance system for mm -hmm. any web-based application. Right. So I know you have uh, many Fortune 500 companies. Right. Uh, you count them among your clients, right? Um, and, and this is a question that I asked PV early in the morning as well. Um, so as a company, when you started out, obviously, you know, hitting Fortune 500 companies and getting them onto your marquee client list is a wish list for most startups, right? Sure. So how did you accomplish that? <laughs> uh, well, a uh, couple of things. Uh, the market category for digital guidance is fairly new. Um, so that helps in a way that we got an early start um, and uh, we are able to gain, garner some kind of mind share with, with enterprises. They understand why it's important to have a digital adoption platform um, so that their users can get more productive. They, they see the light of the day here, um, and that's important. Um, secondly, rapid SaaS adoption by most enterprises, right? Uh, and that's allowed us to be able to remotely sell from India, and that's worked a lot. Um, obviously, there's a focus on secure, scalable, available, uh, you know, an application that's all of the above. And that's how, that's important. That's how we got there, I guess. Sure. Also, from a sales perspective, mm -hmm. you said a lot of selling happens remotely. Yes. Uh, do you also have on-ground sales folks in all of the other locales where you sell? Um, we do have um, on uh, feed on the street in in North America, in mm -hmm. in the US. Um, but for the other regions, it's mostly traveling that's done out of uh, out of India. Sure. Uh, but the quintessential sales cycle starts always here. Um, uh, it starts with your outbound or your inbound coming in BDR right. and then it continues from India. But uh, we, our sales guys do travel a lot. Got it. Also, in terms of just the remote sales, I'm sure you know mm -hmm. you've gone through this journey. Of some things might have worked, some things might not have. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could kind of talk to us of a few learnings, um, especially things that our uh, entrepreneurs sitting here could potentially re-employ. <laughs> uh, I'm not a sales guy, to be honest. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, what's worked? Um, how do I, um, I guess, well, the, you got to have somebody who is aligned with the vision of your product. Mm -hmm. um, your sale guy sh should, should really believe um, that when he is pitching this, you are actually helping them solve the problem right. uh, rather than just selling your product. Um, so I think that's very important and it's worked for us. Um, it's happening from India and we're a success story for that, uh, for the most part. Uh, and. Uh, um, Okay. Sure. <laughs> right. Also, you know, as uh, you know, director of engineering at Watfix, sure. uh, talk to us a little bit about the architecture of Watfix. Right. W what's right. your tech stack looking like? Uh, what are some of the key, you know, frameworks you used? Okay. Uh, you know, when you decided the tech stack for Watfix? Sure. Uh, the tech, tech tech stack is fairly simple. It's simplicity and scalability. It's it's exactly the same. Um, my backend is a typical Java server uh, running in a JT container. I use Cassandra as my database, and I use Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. And considering that Watfix is executing on your, 
your, on, on the end user's browser, the, the front end is basically JavaScript. So uh, the stack is fairly simple. It, it responds very, very well to scale. Mm -hmm. um, so DO is our primary hosting provider. Uh, the entire application is supported by DigitalOcean uh, for us. And um, you know, we are looking to build a lot of value around, uh, around the core product that we have, um, bring in artificial intelligence or machine learning. So we need the compute resources for that as well. Um, so the the dishes the you know the decisions at that point of time were um, were with scale in mind. Um, so that they've been talking a lot of pivot, right? That where you have to make changes. We get that, but we have not really had to make any architectural level changes, mm -hmm. and we're quite happy about that. Uh, Correct. Okay. Also, you did mention you use DO as your uh, yes. cloud provider. Um, you know, and you also kind of spoke about some of the reasons why you chose us. But talk about what's the experience been like uh, using DO. What's worked, sure. what's not? Oh, uh, there's nothing that's not worked, to be honest. Um, we used to be, uh, I'm not sure if I can use it, we used to be hosted on a, uh, on a cloud provider in Germany. Um, and that was three, three and a half years ago. Um, that's when the journey with the digital ocean started. Uh, so the primary reason, uh, you know, there was a lot of concern uh, about the scalability and the availability and the security of that offering at that point of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got into this evaluation mode where we wanted to partner with uh, with a with, with a hosting provider that that's that's going to give us all the things we need mm -hmm. in terms of scale, in terms of security, in terms of compliance, mm -hmm. and in terms of availability. And so that's where our journey started with with DigitalOcean. We started off with two servers. We're around with put thirteen mm -hmm. uh, at at today's you know, uh, sure. point of time. Right. I'm going to preempt some question that I'm sure the audience is going to ask you. You got a recent two and a half million. Uh, series B round. Yes. What's yes. the plan to do with this money? Scale. Okay. Scale. Uh, everything focuses on scale right now, um, because the moment you want to crack the half a million to a million dollar deal, then there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, typically from any big enterprise organization. Um, and uh, as far as we are concerned, it is a B two B product. Mm -hmm. uh, what fix we sell sell it as a B two B product. Uh, but the end users of this product, right? The, the our customers may end up being a B two C. Um, so you open it up to a million users, and then what happens? Can we sustain that kind of hit? Uh, can we sustain that kind of load? So that's very important to us. So uh, there's a lot of effort going into uh, uh, you know preparing for the scale that we want to get to, um, and of course um, preparing for the security levels that we want to keep the application at. Sure. Also, as the engineering director, what are some of the best practices that you follow for your team, right? Um, okay. As you maybe, you know, build your tech team or you spoke about the tech stack. Yeah. But what are some of the things that you find as very key to your engineering team, your engineering organization? Uh, other than the usual, you know, you need the right people. But uh, technology and architecture decisions are very important. Uh, you need to make them with the longer game in, in, in sight. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Um, and you have to prepare for scale. Disruptions, downtimes, uh, they can be deadly. Uh, you don't want to plan for something and realize that my scale was more, so I need to declare downtime to resize everything, and that certainly doesn't work. Um, security is very, very, very important. Um, it cannot be a reaction. It has to be baked into your development lifecycle itself. Um, and uh, keeping it simple. In terms of yeah. over engineering is not required. Yeah, just taking on the over engineering aspect, right? So I very often meet you know startups and entrepreneurs. One thing that they struggle with is you know every time they're at a conference like this, uh, they potentially hear about new tech stacks. Absolutely, uh, right? Uh, there's a new thing that everybody is trying out. Um, and to kind of keep yourself away from maybe it's noise, maybe it's not, but it kind of is a distraction, right? So at Whatfix, how do you kind of uh, stay focused or if at all you kind of look at and evaluate new stacks, right. uh, what's that process like? So you want to evaluate the stack before you come to the point whether you want to make the decision to go ahead with it. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So for example, we're talking about a lot about Kubernetes here. Um, Docker does, does definitely make sense, but has its time come for your particular product? You have to be able to answer that question with some clarity. Um, if it means that you need to support multiple operating systems or multiple uh, OS architectures, then yes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but just so that you want to support Docker, it doesn't make sense to try and re-architect many things. So um, I guess you need to, uh, 
you definitely need to be in touch with the latest technology stacks that are coming out but its application to you should be entirely a technical architecture driven data driven decision that you would like to make right. so at this point probably we'll pause and see if there are any questions from the audience if you could get a mic handy please mohan there's one here to the left Uh, hi, hi Achut. Hi. hi. Uh, good to learn about what fix. Sure. Uh, one question. Uh, so, how do you see the competitors like a Wacomi versus uh -huh. what a fix, and how do you distinguish between the both of you because they themselves are leaders Absolutely. in their category. So, I got to know about it very recently, and then I got to know about what a fix. So I was just going through your website and trying to learn. Right. So, what is your thoughts like? Walk me versus what a fix. What's your USP? Sure. Um, so if you get into the a little bit, dig into the detail of how what fix works, right? Um, in order to create interactive guides, um, we need to be able to understand the host application on which what fix is being uh, integrated with. Uh, now. For example, if your application makes minor changes in terms of components moving from here to there, that doesn't mean your interactive guide should break. Right? I'm just giving you a very watered down example. Now, you asked me what's the difference between WalkMe and WhatFix. Um, so the core algorithm of WhatFix, which is able to identify elements on your host application and then give you guidance accordingly, we feel is much, much stronger. There is a concerted effort from our side to also um, uh, integrate more tightly with certain platforms like a, like Salesforce, like like ServiceNow, like Success Factors. Um, so we study these base platforms or these base applications very, very in very, very in, in detail uh, to understand the quirks of how they design their application, and we try to adapt with that. Um, you obviously, whenever you take features, you want to do this MMR neutralizer and differentiator, right? So. Uh, you want to spend more of your time on, uh, you know, less of your time on MMR and more of your time on differentiators. That's at least that's the focus that we have uh, with respect to our competitors. Uh, so there are many offerings that we give. We have an on-premise solution, for example, that that Walkme doesn't give. Uh, so yeah, there is a couple of points like this that that set us apart. Thank you. Any other questions? I had a couple more. Sure. Um, so, you know, building a SaaS product in India often <laughs> is discussed as, you know, something that's, um, I mean, these days it's becoming more common, but um, not quite when you started out. Yeah, um, right. So talk about your journey and what it's been like to build a SaaS product out of India. <laughs> so, first and foremost, the community is small here, the SaaS community. So the, the advice and the experience is a little bit limited. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, So technology decisions become important uh, because uh, you, you have to live with them for a, for a, for a fairly long period of time. Uh, so you need to choose the right partners that are going to do or help you with infrastructure or, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, so those choices matter a lot mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you, will, you will see the benefit of that only after a year, two years, right? Sure. That's, that's when the... The money starts coming in and that's when you start seeing this. And your inflection point, for example, for us, it's a series B scale comes in. Now you start seeing the cracks or rather you should start seeing the cracks uh, and you start preparing for them a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so our journey, uh, I was the fourth engineer and I'm, I, my team is now about 32, uh, 33 people. Uh, so uh, from a tech-wise you know, uh, like I said before, we hadn't have to change too much, except that we had the, the decision was more uh, important to choose the right partner along the way. Um, I hope that makes sense. Sure. Correct. Also, you know, going back to your previous answer to the question of how you're different from competing sure. products, you spoke about features that you have vis-a-vis -vis a lot of the yeah. others, right? So one thing that commonly gets uh, asked is, you know, 
there are a host of products and features that you can build within a product, right? Yes. Um, so as an engineering manager, what's the framework that you all decide, you know, within your team to know which are the ones that you will prioritize maybe for this quarter, for the current sprint, how do you go about doing that? Sure. Uh, so every, we have our own roadmap. Uh, obviously, we, we from our, which is organic to Watfix um, that we want to see in the product. But you also have the big customers driving their own, um, you know, agenda with us as well which is a good thing. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, but sometimes, you know, so our philosophy is, okay, you give us whatever you need. Um, if it makes sense that we can absorb this into our product roadmap and then uh, roll it out to other people as well, we will take it immediately. But otherwise, uh, it's, more of, um, uh, it's more of a little bit of a negotiation wherein we, customer commitments come first. Mm -hmm. We try not to get very specific. Uh, mm -hmm keep it at a quarter by quarter basis. Um, but otherwise, um, we also give a lot of importance to our own organic roadmap, where we would like to see the product. Because we, we have our own focus areas. It may be uh, EAS or may be learning and development. So we have a certain set of features that we would like to see that, that increase our value in these particular focus areas. Uh, so that is given importance as well. Sure. Uh, from a tech side, it's a little bit of a balance. Every tech team has debt. Uh, so, we try to do our best to, uh, you know, minimize our debt as well along the way. Right. Uh, so, that's where I was getting to next, to technical debt, right? So, very popular <laughs> thing, especially as, like you said, you're now uh, a Series B looking to scale sure. uh, a lot more than what you've done in the past. Um, that also means that you would have not thought through when you built your product, Absolutely. right? Um, so, at that stage, so especially as companies here seated uh, and they're looking to, you know, maybe at a seed stage build their product, right? Sure. How do they figure out what should they build for the MVP? What's your suggestions for them? How do they figure out what to build? Yeah, at least for the MVP stage. Okay. Like what they should, what a high level framework that maybe that you've used on what should go into your MVP and maybe thereafter. <laughs> Break it down for me a little bit, please. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, um, a lot of the entrepreneurs here have an idea. Right? Right. And they want to obviously get to a stage sure. where they're scaling and serving millions of customers, but that's a step-by-step -step process, right? Yes. So as they kind of think through that first stage, uh, is there a high-level framework that maybe you've used at Watfix to say this should be our first iteration of the product and thereafter, maybe at a Series B, this, these are the things that we should do? Sure. Uh, um, so our case, we didn't rely entirely on frameworks for that matter, right? But um, we realize now in hindsight that we should have. Um, if you're building a UI-based product, you definitely want to look at something like a React or an Angular. Uh, we went at it the hard way, uh, and now, you know, we want to bring it in and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, any framework that, that probably reduces your go-to-market time, uh, I think should take a lot of importance uh, in terms of evaluation and getting there. Um, you may not have the vision to plan two, three years ahead, but at least for one year from now, you should be able to capacity plan for yourself and then figure out what you need from an infrastructure point as well. Um, I guess. Sure. That's right. And also as you, um, you, you did kind of lay out a vision on to um, how you plan to scale uh, yeah. in the months ahead. Uh, from that perspective, what's the role that you see, um, you know, a partner like DigitalOcean playing for you? How can we support you in this process? Oh, absolutely. Um, so for me, I, I mentioned this before, scale is very important and scale is baked into DigitalOcean's offering. So uh, for me, that's a no brainer. Um, now, there's also going to be a lot of focus on, on with, with, with GDPR coming in, with, with all the other privacy shield things coming. So there's a lot of focus on security. So we want to bring in a lot of IDS IPS systems or WAFs and there's a cloud firewall, which I'm very excited about to, sure. uh, to evaluate. I've started that, but I want to load balancers and these become, uh, you know, any RFP that you get from a very big uh, firm, they're going to ask you all these set of questions. Right. And you shouldn't have to do this just because you're being asked about it. You should do this because it's the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, all the other things that we want to add, um, we have all these crazy ideas to run POCs and things like that. So Compute Power helps us. DO has been a partner along the way. Spin up something, test it out, figure out, do a minimum viable product. Uh, right. And then if it works, you productize it. If it's not, drop it and move on. Uh, so our agility is what we are looking for. For support with from uh, from Dio. That's great to know. Um, you know, in terms of I know we're almost out of time. Um, 
just based on your learnings, right, running an engineering team, uh, what are some of the key takeaways that you would want to share with the audience here um, that will help a lot of budding entrepreneurs and technologists here? Well, you got to hire people who align with your vision. Uh, that's that's the first and foremost thing. This they, they talk about a culture fit. This is part of a culture fit. Uh, it's very important. I don't know how to quantify it, but uh, I have done thousands and thousands of interviews and then somehow you get it. It's more of a gut feeling. Um, but you also want to um, first get your core team in place. That's very important. You want the the senior engineers to be in place first. Um, you don't want to do it the other way around because it can tend, you tend to become bottom heavy and then nothing works. There's sure. only chaos. So you need the right people to make the right architecture decisions which are your senior engineers and then uh, they push that vision to the others uh, right. uh, to build this team. So you build it top down uh, and then take it from there. That's That's been the learning that we have had uh, sure. in terms of uh, in terms of building our engineering team. That's great, Archul.